number 212, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. Would you please stand? Please be seated. So the church looks different. We are set and ready and midway through our arts festival. And uh, what a blessing it's been. Hasn't it been fantastic? Um, the blessing started on Monday tea time when the clouds darkened and a Troops of thousands came and just put up the marquees and I felt like I sneezed it and it all happened. So uh, absolutely awesome. Thank you to uh, the many hands that made light work. And uh, what a joy to just use this wonderful resource that we have in this church over a millennium old um, and just show off people's beautiful artwork and... Uh, haven't we got some amazing photos for the up potential calendar? Um, I think we could probably have about three or four calendars worth. So um, we're really going to struggle to narrow that down. But uh, that's been a lovely thing to add. And uh, if you have chance, do stick around for the fabulous lunch. So far, I've only tried the salmon. I st I've still got to make my way through the ham and the cheese. So... Uh... <laughs> But uh, thank you to everybody who has worked so blooming hard 
to welcome so many people through the door and uh, we're very fortunate and blessed to have Bishop Roger turn up on Friday night and uh, I asked him to speak uh, to camera about developing a culture of welcome and he spoke for a minute about developing a culture of welcome and the reason why I asked him to do that is to do with our prayer meeting on Thursday night. We're going to pray and plot, pray and plot how we lead our churches into growth. And one of the themes is developing a culture of welcome. And sometimes what you do as a vicar or as a priest or a rector is you say, fantastic, you're already doing it. And I've really longed to see the, uh, the arts festival and like Chernwood, it's just a dazzling example of uh, fantastic hospitality and welcome and I think it'll just be a blessing to the life and the health of the church so thank you again and if you're around on Thursday um, we are going to pray and plot and uh, it's going to be at St Andrew's Hub uh, this Thursday coming up and then the following uh, third Thursday will be the 21st of July um, I'm just wondering 7.30 would we be able to use the meeting room yes. yeah so we're going to cycle around the venues because this is a benefice uh, planning and plotting and praying group you don't have to be on the PCC to attend uh, the idea is we're just going to think and pray about how we can be woven together as the body of Christ and just utilise the best resources out there to help disciple people, help people get to know Jesus better. If you're interested in health following the pandemic, we have the lead chaplain from the North East London Foundation Trust. He's going to speak to folks who are interested in health and mental health, and that's on the Thursday the 23rd of June, 12 till 2. Don't let me be the blockage in you going. Book direct and let us know if you want to go. Let us know if you need a lift. Let us know if you can drive and have got some spare seats in your car. But the idea is that we think through the raised anxiety that people might have, the issue of isolation and some of the long-term issues that we might have coming out of the pandemic and how we as a church can be best set to support our nation so if you want to engage with that I'm advertising it beyond our formal pastoral team if that's something you want to come to please do pop along before you die by death by notices uh, two more things Ministry for Men, we've got on the 23rd of June a trip to see Tim Palmer at Thorrington, his flying machine. Um, there will be possibly a sausage sizzle and drinks to be imbibed. Non-alcohol as well as alcoholics, so we need to be responsible. And then in July, we're going to look at John's Big Tractors. So if you're interested in that, that's the 23rd of June for the planes and the 28th of July. Timings will be around about 7 o'clock. And although this is ministry for men, we don't want our riot on our hands. Ladies, you are welcome. But I, I saw the pitchforks rising. <laughs> If you'd like to help run a coffee shop at the New Wine Conference uh, this summer, or you could assist in caring for children with additional needs, yes, there's various hoops to get through, but if you're available to volunteer for two days, three days, five days, two weeks, uh, do speak to me. We're going to see if we can offer a bit of assistance. Um, it might be something for you. You might know of a late teen, a 20 year old, 20 uh, something or yourself who might be able to help. Finally, uh, on the back page there's stuff about history uh, that Rob is flying the flag for. September the 24th folks is the 100th anniversary of the building of the Memorial Hall in Freighting. Freighting is a village in our benefice. 
And if we think that coming out of the back of the First World War, within four years, they generated enough money to then build Freighty Memorial Hall. What an achievement. And we want to mark the 100th anniversary. So if we could support that, that's a Saturday the 24th, if you can be around. Pauline's also going to do some training on leading intercessions. And that's the 10th of September, 10 till 1. Any other notices? Yeah, so help taking down the marquee tomorrow afternoon. We're going to say 17.30? Yes, 5.30. 5, 5.30. And also, after all the fun of today, at 4.30, we're going to have a Songs of Praise service. I'm not sure we're going to have the Red Arrows do a fly past. They've been quite busy recently. So we won't have the Red Arrows, but if you want to come along, it'll be fairly informal, relaxed. A 4.30 service, giving thanks and what we're going to do is going to have it while the exhibition's all on so it might be a bit blurred and blended but that'll be fine my goodness Andrew what a lot of notices there we are in today's service we have the setting of the art we recognise that we ourselves are made in the image of God, a temple of the Holy Spirit, and also we hold an expression of God's creation in our human form. I'm delighted that uh, instead of hearing a rambling rector, you will have an artist share with you a reflection for today. We're really uh, privileged to have Judith Clayton come and join us. Uh, we, we've, we've shipped her in from Thorrington and uh, Judith is going to bring a reflection from a piece of art that... Uh, when, when did you complete it? It was a few years ago. When did you complete the piece of art? Four years ago, okay, and uh, she's just going to share a thought, a reflection uh, to, to go with that. Today is Trinity Sunday, and we think about God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Loving God, we've come to worship you. Fill us with your life-giving, joy-giving peace giving presence that we may praise you now with our lips and all the day long with our lives through Jesus Christ our Lord Amen so for setting the scene at this all age worship I'm just wondering what you have in your mind as a good way of reflecting on the nature of the Trinity It might be an image or an example that you're fond of that works for you. We're just going to pause and reflect on what that might be. If you want to share it with a person beside you, you can. But in a minute's time, we're just going to share some of the ways that we think about the Trinity. So let's just take a minute. Feel free to chat amongst yourselves.
I'm not sure if this microphone works, but we'll see if we can do a roving mic. Can you hear me okay? What do we find as a helpful way of thinking about the Trinity? Any, anybody want to share? Who wants to be brave? Barry! I'll have to give Jill the credit because she said when we were sitting here in the back row a three leaf clover but I added a four leaf clover because three leaf clover is what we believe in and the fourth is ourselves. Oh. Helen! I just think of water because it can exist, it's still water but it can exist in three states so you've got the solid, the ice, you've got the liquid water and you've got the steam. Very good. Now the the three states, water as liquid, vapour and ice, that was how I illustrated the nature of the Holy Trinity when I was an RE teacher. And I had to get myself organised that I had some ice cubes in an ice pack and a kettle with me that had been pat tested. Peter. Well, I think of God as an entity which we accept and believe in and trust. Um, Jesus, his son, and then the spirit of what they put upon our universes and our lives. Thank you. So God, the Father, God the Son, the Spirit, God with us, the power, thank you. Okay, anybody else? Jeff. I think of God, the Holy, the Trinity as a house. God the Father designed it. God the Son built it. God the Holy Spirit lives in it. Oh, we like that. I've not heard that before. I do like that. Thank you. Holy Trinity is a house. God designed it. God the Son built it. God the Holy Spirit lives in it. Very good. Any other analogies for the Trinity? Judith. Um, we're, we're made in God's image. So as body, mind and spirit. So God the Father, the mind, um, the spirit, the Holy Spirit and um, our body, the physical body, Jesus is incarnation. Lovely. Thank you. Got some zingers here. Would you like an encouragement and a discouragement? The encouragement is that even when we come up with wonderful examples, we are still merely grasping. A fr dear friend of mine is doing a Master's in Theology and he's done a whole term on the Holy Trinity. And actually, with the Trinity, these are our best attempts at trying to understand the Trinity. So all the examples you gave are wonderful and really helpful, but we need to recognise these are our best attempts. That there is also an element of profound mystery. Shall we pray the Trinity prayer today? Shall we say it together? Holy God, faithful and unchanging, enlarge our minds with the knowledge of your truth and draw us more deeply into the mystery of your love that we may truly worship you, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. One God, now and forever. Amen. Let's continue our worship with number 318. Lord, thy word abideth. Would you please stand for number 318.
please be seated as we pray. Let us give thanks to the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, we pray together, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing. Before the world was made, God chose us in Christ that we might be holy and blameless before him. Let us praise God for the glory of his grace, for the free gift he gave us in his dear Son, to Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Give praise and dominion, honour and might, for ever and ever. Amen. We confess to you our selfishness and lack of love, Fill us with your spirit. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. We confess to you our fear and failure in sharing our faith. Fill us with your spirit. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. We confess to you our stubbornness and lack of trust. Fill us with your spirit. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. To everyone who is sorry for what they have done wrong, God gives us forgiveness and grants us the right to begin again. Thanks be to God. Amen. So we continue with hymn number 311, Lord Jesus Christ. Would you please stand?
The reading is from the eighth chapter of Proverbs. Does not wisdom call, and does not understanding raise her voice? On the heights beside the way, at the crossroads, she takes her stand. Beside the gates in front of the town, at the entrance of the portals, she cries out, To you, O people, I call, and my cry is to all that live. The Lord created me at the beginning of his work, the first of his acts of long ago. Ages ago, ages ago I was set up at the first, before the beginning of the earth. When there were no depths, I was brought forth. And when there were no springs abounding with water, before the mountains had been shaped, before the hills, I was brought forth. When he had not yet made earth and fields, or the world's first bits of soil. When he established the heavens, I was there. When he drew a circle on the face of the deep, and when he made firm the skies above, when he established the fountains of the deep, when he assigned to the sea its limits, so that the waters might not transgress his command, when he marked out the foundations of the earth, then I was beside him like a master worker. And I was daily his delight, rejoicing before him always, rejoicing in his inhabited world, and delighting in the human race. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So just before Judith comes to uh, share the gospel reading, but just before we have the gospel reading, a reflection, a very short comment. In our Proverbs reading, we hear about wisdom. And wisdom actually having a character and a nature of their own. And quite often in um, the Old Testament, the gender of wisdom is female, lady wisdom. Now the interesting thing at this art exhibition that we need to bear in mind is that when in scripture it talks about the Holy Spirit inspiring the craftsmen who decorate the temple of Solomon the inspiration and the skill that they are gifted the Hebrew word yes can be this you know, filled with the spirit element, but it's also that they receive this element of wisdom where the skill that they have is an expression of, of, of a crafting wisdom. And uh, I just thought I'd share that with you, that actually we're appreciating these beautiful works of art and that there is a wisdom maybe there in the skill and the craft of, of the application of the artist to express something in physical form. Let's just have our gospel reading and then Judith will share with us. So the gospel is taken from John 16, verse 12 to 15. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the spirit of truth comes... He will guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak on his own, but will speak whatever he hears. And he will declare to you the things that are to come. The Spirit will glorify me because the Spirit will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. And for this reason, I said that the Holy Spirit will take what is mine and declare it to you. Shall we just pray for Judith as she comes to share? Heavenly Father, thank you for Judith, for all that she is to us as a benefice. Thank you for her gift and wisdom, her talent, her skill as an artist. And Lord, her prayer 
is that you would be at work by your Holy Spirit, unlocking our hearts, unlocking doors, for us to encounter you afresh this day. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Judith. Well, as you can see, I brought along a door for you to look at. Behind the door is a painting of my imagination. What do you notice about it? It's quite a cosy door, say from a co country cottage. Certainly not a grand door from a castle or a palace. It's very small too. You would have to be very small to go through this one. And I can tell you that it only has a handle on this side, so only you can open it. Now there's something I would like you to do. Um, if we've got any children here. <laughs> um, I want you to draw what you see in your imagination, um, what's on the other side of that door when you open it. It can be anything you like. There's no right or wrong answers. Um, is there any, are there any papers and crayons for the children to draw? Is, are there any children here? <laughs> oh, right. <laughs> um, if you want inspiration, there's plenty of paintings and drawings and beautiful artwork here to inspire you. Anyway, at the end of this, at the end of the service, maybe if you want to, you can carefully open the door and see what I imagined. It's very apparent when looking at works of art in any exhibition how different every painting is, even though they might be of the same subject matter. Every artist has their own personable style, which reflects their inner life, their choice of colour, tone and texture. We know that certain colours have a direct influence on our moods. The cooler end of the colour spectrum tends to have a calming effect, and there was one that, painting that struck me on this side of a painting water, and it was very blue and there, there was a boat. Um, and I thought how calm it was, it was my, that was my response to it. And there are others um, who are very energetic, you know, the paint is very energetic, the paint, paint has been applied seemingly quickly and full of dashes, and there are some beautiful paintings of foliage on this side. But let's take, for example, Van Gogh. During the latter part of his life, he used vivid colours and highly textured use of paint. His brushstrokes were swirling and sinuous, which probably reflected his inner turmoil. Whereas Monet loves some mauves and pale blues and fresh greens, create a sense of peace and calm. It's true to say that art provides a door into the inner life of the artist. Four years ago, I included this door in my art exhibition at Clare Priory in Suffolk. What was really interesting was that some viewers didn't open it. Some people looked behind it, others were too tentative to open it in case it fell over. Others didn't think that they were allowed to open it, while well, some opened the door and no doubt had their own private response. It was an interesting reflection on human nature. I was told that when this church had its extension built, a door was discovered that had been blocked off many years ago. I wonder how many secret doors similarly are blocked off for one reason or another. The door is a potent symbol in many cultures. It often symbolizes a transition from one state to another. We often see the door used to heighten tension in movies. A locked door is particularly mysterious. Why is it locked? Is there something scary behind it or equally is there something beautiful like a room containing treasures? One of my favourite children's stories is The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe. Lucy's adventure begins when she plays hide and seek with her brothers Edmund, Peter and sister Susan. Let me read the moment that Lucy discovers that the wardrobe door is an entry into Narnia. This must be a simply enormous wardrobe, thought Lucy, going still further in and pushing the soft folds of the coats aside to make room for her. 
Then she noticed that there was something crunching under her feet. I wonder if that's more mothballs, she thought, stooping down to feel it with her hand. But instead of feeling the hard, smooth wood of the floor of the wardrobe, she felt something soft and powdery and extremely cold. This is very queer, she said, and went on a step or two further. The next moment she found what it was rubbing in, she found that what was rubbing against her face and hands was no longer soft fur, but something hard and rough and even prickly. Why, it is just like branches of trees, exclaimed Lucy. And then she saw that there was a light ahead of her, not a few inches away from where the back of the wardrobe ought to have been, but a long way off. Something cold and soft was falling on her. A moment later, she found she was standing in the middle of a wood at night time, with snow under her feet and snowflakes falling through the air. Lucy felt a little frightened, but she felt very inquisitive and excited as well. She looked back over her shoulder, and there, between the dark tree trunks, she could still see the open doorway of the wardrobe, and even catch a glimpse of the empty room from which she had set out. She had, of course, left the door open, for she knew that it was a very silly thing to shut oneself in the wardrobe. This children's story is much a story for adults as well as children. In the last book of the series, The Last Battle, C.S. Lewis uses the symbol of the stable door as a means for entering into the infinite from the finite. In the book, some people see the stable door of Bethlehem as a smelly place and choose not to explore it further. But for those who further go further in, find a world beyond any imaginings. God speaks to us in many different ways. St. Francis saw nature as the doorway to the infinite. Nature was his cathedral. I can't expand here how many parallels there are between the rhythms of nature and our own spiritual lives. That would require another reflection in its own right. But it's enough to see that nature is a door in which we can see God at work. Last week, we celebrated the birth of the church at Pentecost. After the crucifixion, the disciples were afraid for their lives and hid behind locked doors. But on the day of Pentecost, as they were praying together, the Holy Spirit came upon them and unlocked the door of their hearts, and the world was never the same again. There is an old saying that was often quoted to me by my mother whenever I experienced disappointment and became, or became discouraged. When one door closes, another door opens. The older I get, the more I see this pattern in many lives. Many negative experiences can be redeemed by turning things around and using the experience to help others. It's a way in which the world can be transformed. Some of you may have read a book by Johnny Erickson in which she recounts a dreadful life-changing accident which resulted in her becoming a paraplegic. There was a long period of intense suffering as she tried to come to terms with what had happened to her. Many pray, friends, pray, Many friends prayed for her healing with no physical results, but throughout this time there was an inner healing and a preparation for a ministry unbeknown to her. Johnny was given the opportunity to speak about her faith and how it changed her perspective on life. Her books and public speaking have given her a worldwide ministry to give hope and encouragement in desperate situations. One door closes, another door opens. To me, the door is a symbol of hope, of transition and growth, opportunity and adventure. I finish with the closing paragraphs of one of Susan Howitcher's novels from the Starbridge series. The story is about a woman who is an alcoholic and despises herself and finds it impossible to recognize authentic gestures of love and care. In the concluding paragraphs, she meets up with an old friend who has become a minister. Well, I said brightly, pausing on the porch and wondering what on earth had driven, driven me to ramble on so disjointly about the ancient Hollywood epic of Ben Hur. It's been heavenly to see you again. Keep treading those mystical paths. I suppose you'll eventually waft back into my orbit someday, just as you always do. 
In reply, he took out his wallet and produced a card and handed it to me. The card read, The Reverend Nicholas Durrow, St. Bennet's by the Wall, Egg Street, London, EC2. Give me a call, he said, when you get back to town. My dear, what fun, but I mustn't distract you from all your paranormal phenomena. I was acutely aware that he asked for neither my phone number or my new address. The card was a mere gesture of politeness, nothing more, a move which could be labelled concerned and caring, a minor spiritual charade which would solve his Christian conscience. So long, Venetia, he was saying with a smile as he turned away into the north porch. He even added that most meaningless of all Americanisms, take care. Goodbye, Nick. I remained outside, staring after him. His card already screwed up my hand for deposit in the nearest litter bin. Then he stopped. He'd reached the huge oak door which led to the cathedral, into the cathedral. And for one long moment, he stood there. He stood there as if waiting by the great closed door. And suddenly I thought, Holman Hunt, the light of the world. I knew then what was going to happen next, but I didn't dare believe it. My voice cried in my head, he won't, he can't, he couldn't. But he did. And as I stared through my tears in wonder, unable to move or speak, he turned to me and stretched out his hand. From one invitation to another, we're going to listen to the tune of hymn number 378 and then we'll stand to sing it. So if we just listen through to familiarise ourselves and then we'll stand to sing. Number 378.
Would you please be seated for our prayers? At this time of continuing war and destruction and death in Ukraine, let us first pray for the people of Ukraine with a prayer from Archbishop Justin Welby and our previous Bishop of Chelmsford, Stephen Cottrell. God of peace and justice, we pray for the people of Ukraine today. We pray for peace and the laying down of weapons. We pray for all those who fear for tomorrow that your spirit of comfort would draw near to them. We pray for those with power over war or peace, for wisdom, discernment, and compassion to guide their decisions. Above all, we pray for all your precious children at risk and in fear, that you would hold and protect them. We pray in the name of Jesus, the Prince of Peace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And at this time of deep sadness for all those Ukrainian people who have died, been injured, made homeless, or left the country as refugees in the last three months, let us pray with a bit of humour for interventions to restore their country to its rightful independence. It's a bit of an Old Testament prayer called, Could You Smite Him, Lord? O oh Lord, I really want to ask you to smite Mr. Putin. It hasn't got to be a big smite, just enough to remove him from power, topple him from his throne, remove his advisers, disable his armed forces, and make him see sense. Is that a big ask, Lord? After all, you seem to have smote a lot in the Bible. Powerful kings brushed away, invading generals confounded by your power, or had their heads chopped off by some pretty feisty women so that your people would be free. Even your mother sung of your power to remove tyrants from their thrones, and she faced the might of Rome. The problem with asking for some smiting is that we're a peace-loving parish. We don't really believe in violence. We, we think anger can be used more productively. We know you call us to solve our pro own problems and not depend on you to sort out our messes. But just this once, Lord, a bit of a smite, a localised precision smite, perhaps. In the meantime, Lord, please look after Mr. Zelensky. Inspire him to continue to use his skills to defend his people. Protect him as you protected his ancestors of old. Give hope to the people of Ukraine. Hope in your providence. Hope that the world won't ignore their plight. Hope that the invaders will go. And if after that you've got time for some gentle smiting, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And let us pray for ourselves and our communities at a time of financial difficulties for many, as the price of food and energy seems to be increasingly unmanageable. Gracious God, we know that your love is infinite and that you care about all areas of our life. In this time of economic insecurity, Help us to trust that all of our security is in you. Keep us mindful that you always have and always will provide for our needs. Apart from you, we can do nothing. Merciful God, we ask that you give our leaders the wisdom to guide our nation and the world out of the current economic crisis. Help us to protect the poor 
and all those who are struggling during this difficult time. Provide for their needs and give them hope. Open new opportunities for them and furnish the resources they need to live with dignity. Encourage those who have enough to share essential resources with those who lack the necessities of life and to do so with humble, grateful and loving hearts. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And finally, Heavenly Father, we ask you to stir our hearts into action. Inspire us with ways we can make a difference in our homes, communities and the worlds around us to help our communities both here and in the wider world. We pray for your prompting where we can do more to love our neighbours. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And let us pray for our church in Elmstead, our sister churches and congregations of St Andrew and St Mary Magdalene. Pray for, pray for Andrew, our rector, Tim, our curate, and Pauline, our associate priest. Let's pray for the beneficial response to leading your church into growth conference. And let us pray for our deanery of St Osith, praying for the churches, the clergy and the congregations who live, work and worship here with us. And let us pray for the world and especially for peaceful resolutions in areas of conflict. Let us pray for the sick and those who love and care for them. Lynn, Louisa, David, Jasper, Jenny, Brenda, Margaret, Claire, Roy, Malcolm, Emma, Joanne, Naomi, David and Elizabeth, Pam, Lawrence, Evelyn, David, Ian, Sylvia and Jeff, Paul, Janie, Michael and Beryl. And let us pray for those living in residential care and those who look after them. Ellen, Yvonne, Muriel, Maureen, Pat, Vera, Steve, Ray and Marjorie. And let us pray for those who've died recently and the bereaved. Richard Maynard and especially Valerie Skinner remembering all the contributions she made to our art festival each year and with a special prayer from William Brake. The divine vision still was seen, still was the human form design. Weeping in weak and mortal clay, O oh Jesus, still the form was thine. And thine the human face and thine the human hands and feet and breath entering through the gates of birth and passing through the gates of death. And let us also pray for those whose anniversary of death falls this week and those who mourn their loss. Samantha, Limpscombe, David Lloyd, June Hill and Mavis Cook. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. And so rejoicing in the fellowship of Mary, the mother of God, St. Anne, St. Lawrence, St. Andrew, St. Mary Magdalene, and of all your saints, we commend ourselves and all people to your unfailing love. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our church family prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, 
now and forever. Amen. And just before our final hymn and closing prayer, a reminder that we've got a quiet hour on Monday night at 7.30. Uh, Tim is running a Kintsugi Hope course, which is about well-being at St Andrews at 1.30 on Wednesday. And remember the prayer and plotting meeting leading your church into growth also at St Andrews and our work party next Saturday at 10 o'clock yep uh, if you can come to that you're very welcome let's stand for our final hymn fourth in thy name O Lord I go number 143 number 143 closing prayer shall we pray together Father God you are everything to us you give us life you fill us with your love and set us free from sin that we might live in you take our lives and may we show your love in everything we say in Jesus name Amen so just before a blessing, it would be right to have a Trinity blessing. We have an artist who has invited us to engage in an artistic piece. And can I suggest that as you do, you treat that as a prayer. It's the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son and Holy Spirit be upon you now and always. Amen. So go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen.